In the previous module, we looked at several static morphometric measures, which are often different in Chiari patients, but on their own, still don't tell the whole Chiari story. In this module, we will try to fill in more pieces of the puzzle by examining the dynamic measures of CSF flow, longitudinal impedance, and neural tissue motion. Cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, is a water-like liquid which bathes the brain and spine and serves a number of vital functions, such as providing protection from injury, delivering nutrients, and removing waste products. CSF is continuously created and absorbed, and it circulates throughout the brain and spine in the subarachnoid space, which sits below the dura. CSF circulation is driven primarily by the cardiac cycle and is influenced by breathing. When the heart beats blood is pumped into the brain, which in turn forces CSF out of the brain and into the spine during the second part of the cardiac cycle. This process is reversed and CSF flows back into the brain from a spine. The end result is that CSF essentially sloshes back and forth between the brain and spine in a pulsatile fashion. How hard a person is breathing influences this movement by changing the relative pressure between the brain and spine areas. With Chiari, herniated tonsils obstruct the CSF pathways between the brain and spine and restrict or resist the natural flow back and forth. In fact, one of the main goals of decompression surgery is to restore the natural flow of CSF across the craniovertebral junction by opening up the blocked passages. Over the years, researchers and clinicians have focused their attention on trying to understand what is happening dynamically at the craniovertebral junction by quantifying the amount and nature of the CSF flow, the resistance introduced by the herniated tonsils, and the movement of the cerebellum and brainstem in response to the cardiac cycle. MRIs are amazing machines, and they can be programmed to do more than take static images. Specifically, they can be used to capture the flow of CSF using one of several different techniques. The results can then be evaluated qualitatively, meaning just visually, or through quantitative analysis to determine specific velocities and other characteristics. Despite some early promise, the clinical usefulness of qualitatively assessing CSF flow studies is not clear. Not all surgeons use them, but they may add value in some cases in trying to decide if decompression surgery will help relieve the patient's symptoms. Quantitative studies comparing Chiari patients to healthy volunteers have found that Chiari patients have disrupted flow patterns and higher velocities around the herniated tonsils, which return to closer to normal after surgery. Unfortunately, this disrupted pattern is also seen in subjects with tonsillar herniation but no symptoms. However, research has shown that people with herniations, but enough space that the flow is not disrupted tend to not respond to surgery. The limited utility of CSF flow has led researchers to look for additional dynamic measures. In the field of fluid dynamics, resistance to the pulsatile motion of a fluid, like CSF into and out of the brain, is called longitudinal impedance, and Conquer Chiari researchers have conducted several interesting studies on this topic. Specifically, using high resolution MRI imaging, they developed a technique to calculate longitudinal impedance based on an individual's unique anatomy. Using this technique, they found that the average longitudinal impedance among adult Chiari patients was 551, which was more than double the average impedance of healthy volunteers at 220. In a separate study, they also found there was a significant difference in the impedance between Chiari patients with and without cough headaches. Specifically, the average impedance of patients with cough headaches was 776, compared to an average of only 285 for patients without cough headaches. However, these are just averages and not every patient with a cough headache had a high impedance, just as not every patient without cough headaches had a low impedance. Unfortunately, calculating longitudinal impedance for a specific individual is a labor and computer-intensive process and is currently not practical for use in a diagnostic capacity. However, this work does provide important clues as to what is happening dynamically in Chiari patients. Next, we will turn our attention from CSF flow and impedance to the motion of brain tissue, 
specifically the cerebellum and brainstem, during decompression surgery. Surgeons have noted that the cerebellar tonsils of Chiari patients visibly pulsate with a heartbeat. In fact, one indication of adequate decompression is that this pulsation is reduced. Conquer Chiari researchers have taken this further by quantifying this movement using an extremely accurate MRI technique called displaced encoding with stimulated echoes, or dense. Dense imaging has been shown to accurately capture tissue motion down to the width of a human hair or less. In dense studies, researchers have shown that the cerebellums of Chiari patients move on average 100% more than healthy volunteers and that their brainstems move 64% more. This extra motion translates to a 50% increase in the strain placed on the cerebellum of Chiari patients. In a second study of patients who underwent dense imaging both before and after surgery, researchers found that surgery reduced the motion of the cerebellum by nearly half and the brainstem by 22%. Finally, a recent study found that surgical patients with more tissue motion before surgery experience the largest reductions in motion after surgery. However, linking dense measured motion with specific Chiari symptoms has proven to be elusive. So, while it is clear that Chiari patients have more tissue motion and result in strain than healthy people, in absolute terms this motion is very small and the impact is not clear. On the other hand, the data so far has been collected while lying in an MRI machine, and the increase in strain that Chiari patients may experience during coughing, straining, or exercising is not known and might be enough to damage neural connections. To summarize, Chiari patients in general exhibit disrupted CSF flow around the cerebellar tonsils, higher levels of impedance to the CSF flow, and an increase in motion of the cerebellum and brainstem, all of which can be quantified. However, much like with the static morphometric measurements, this is not true for all Chiari patients. And other than the cough headache, these dynamic markers are not strongly linked with specific symptoms or overall symptom severity. So while they add more pieces to the puzzle, it is still not clear why some people with herniations don't experience symptoms or why the majority of Chiari patients aren't diagnosed until their early 30s. In the next module, we will discuss a new theory which Conquer Chiari researchers have developed that addresses these questions.